This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Healthcare and Hospital Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Committed to advancing health and economic opportunity for all Virginians. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond and a very special welcome to three friends, colleagues that I have known for the better part of my life, and particularly down at the capital of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, Charles or Chuck Duvall uh, with the Lindell Corporation, John Jones with the Sheriff's Association, and James or Jim Turpin with the Wine Council and One Virginia 21. And I was counting it up and, and without even overestimating you guys have more than 100 years' experience down at the Capitol. And I think it would be very interesting and informative to our viewers to hear some of your comments about what's the same now as it always has been, what's, what's different uh, beyond the buildings, what, what's different now than, than in those earlier years. And I think as we were talking about when you first started, Chuck, you started a year or two before these other guys, so why don't we start with you and then others of you chime in or I'll call on you if you haven't said anything. Well, obviously a lot of things have changed. One thing in particular, you've gone from one party politics to at least two party politics for the most part. Um, you gotta remember in the 70s, you were coming out of the Byrd era um, and the Democrats, I think, were trying to figure out what they really were. The mm -hmm. Republican Party was trying to grow, and it's grown uh, obviously substantially in that period of time. Um, and a lot has changed too, just we're sitting here with TV, technology's changed. It plays a role, I think a lesser role probably in what the three of us do for a living. But in terms of the people that serve, it, it plays a big mm -hmm. role. But just two quick observations. You know, Chuck touched on technology. Back in the old days, the morning and hour, was the morning hour. That's when you introduced your friends that came to visit in the General Assembly, the members of the House and Senate, and they would introduce the school teachers and the deputy sheriffs and the sheriffs that came or whoever came from the community. And because of that technology, the morning hour now is much more. It's, uh, it's a place you make 30 second sound bites. And we've seen that change. That's come about in the last 10 or 15 years. One thing that hadn't changed is the integrity of what you have to do to get something done. And we've been here a while, and when you, when you tell someone what you're gonna do, and when you, make, when you make a representation, that hadn't changed. It had to be accurate back then, and it has to be accurate now. Jim? I think the, the quality of the people serving has remained consistent. It's um, in many ways a similar institution that dates back to Jamestown but it's also evolving and the members, the members are still high quality individuals and, and your word is, um, it, is your bond j j just like their, uh, their quality individuals to work with. But the institution has changed. I think in many ways it's become more, it's become more uh, partisan in many ways, and it's also become more urban-suburban as opposed to a rural General Assembly than it was in the 70s when we all came. 
What, what about the public's involvement um, in what's taking place? Is that about the same, or is that in, is it changed in some I think ways? It's, I think that's changed quite a bit because in the old days, the lobbyists used to go down to the bill room and pick up the bill. I did that. You'd get a stack of bills. You'd go through them. I would find out, you know, look at the ones that had to do with the sheriffs. And it probably took three or four days to get that information out, to let all the sheriffs know, you know, what had been introduced and what committee it's going in. Now, everybody's a lobbyist. They can go on to lobbyist in the box. They can click on the bill. They can see what was introduced by day. They can see instantaneously what committee is in, whose committee, uh, I mean, who's on the committee. And so that has, that has evolved quite a bit. That's one of the major changes I've, I've seen. I think John's right on point. The, you know, the participation of the public, if they want to participate. And you see, I think what that does, though, that leads a lot of groups probably on the fringes in both parties to be the activists and, uh, and probably cuts down some the influence of some of the people that really ought to be there and help and try to make form those decisions. But he's exactly right. Anybody that wants to be informed today is informed instantaneously. And just the sheer volume of the number of individuals who come to the General Assembly. There's, uh, at the building we're now out of, there was a line down the, d down the block to go, uh, to go through security. That didn't used to be the way. I, I remember, John talking about picking up bills. I remember my first session when I was a legislative intern. My job was to type the, uh, to type the legislative report for the Municipal League on a stencil and then run it off and mail it out so they would have it by Monday. So, uh, so that, was, uh, that was in the 1970s and now, now you can get instantaneously what happened. Now we're going to taping, or not taping, but live right. video. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the involvement must have been positive over the years. Or people talk about having second or third or fourth careers. Uh, John, I guess you've been with the Sheriff's Association for more than half of your life. Yeah, and, I've been and, there 40 years yeah. with the Sheriff's Association. Yes. Started in 1977. Right. Just completed my 40th year in this past August. And it, it's really an honor to represent the Sheriff. They're elected law enforcement. They're the only elected law enforcement in Virginia. And I wake up every day going to work and thinking about it. I've got to represent one of the best groups out there that anybody could represent. I'm, I'm really honored to do that. And, and Chuck, you've represented lots of different organizations, clients, associations over the years. But you must have enjoyed it or you wouldn't have... Well, David, I'm too old to go to truck driving school, so <laughs> right. it cuts that out. But no, you, you know, it's a little bit like herding cats, but uh, you get accustomed to it. I mean, there are a lot of personalities. You've got to learn to work with the personalities. And what Jim said, I think the integrity, and John alluded to that too, uh, that's a big piece of it. You, you, you know, you, I think probably legislators and I'll say lobbyists get criticized for a lot of things because you get one or two bad actors and the next thing you know, the whole paint slopped on everybody. And that, that's just, uh, just the way it is. So you gotta, you gotta put up with that if you're gonna do this job. And if you got thin skin, you better <laughs> find something else to do, right, John? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and Jim, you, stopped for a while and, and even referred to yourself as a recovering lobbyist. Then I fell off the wagon. And, and, then, and, and now, you're, now you're back, so you couldn't stay away either. Well, I, I, started, I started in uh, Richmond at the state level, moved to the federal and even some international work, and then came back to my roots where I started at the General Assembly because there were people there that uh, that I still knew, that I'd still worked with, and that I enjoyed it and come to find out I was still pretty good at it and um, was, was glad to be back um, in an, in, in, as part of the institution. As you look back in the earliest years, hmm. what really prepared you for doing that? What You came from, you had different backgrounds and uh, not all of you went to VMI, right? <laughs> So what, what really prepared you? What, there's someone watching the show now who may be our children's age or maybe my grandchildren's age might say, I would be interested in doing that 
that kind of work that these guys are talking about. So as you reflect on what prepares you, what do you think would well prepare the, the next generation who might come along and want to do the kind of work you're doing? I, I learned the basics of it through politics and the interest in politics and the people, the people who get elected. Um, I remember my mother was education chair for the League of Women Voters in Atlanta and used to take me to the Capitol and I just thought it was the most fascinating prog process and in Georgia it was like the circus coming to town and just became enthralled with, uh, with the whole legislative process and, uh, and how it works and the ins and outs of it and the individuals that make it up. I think uh, I came in through a different door. I, I didn't come in to be a lobbyist. I kind of had to register as a lobbyist and, and become a lobbyist to do the job the sheriffs wanted me to do, and that is to get the message out on what their issues were. So my background was public safety. I came, worked as in criminal justice planning. That's my education. And, and when I became the executive director of the Sheriff's Association, the sheriffs looked at me and says, you know, you, you might ought to go to the Capitol and, and tell everyone what we're doing and, and, and how much this cost. And that's how I got into lobbying. Mm -hmm. It kind of became a necessity uh, as, a second, as a second thought. Well, John, I think, came out of the right course. I mean, he, he, he's a you know, specific expert in that arena and done one devil of a job for the sheriffs and for law enforcement his entire career. Mine came in, I came a little bit like Jim. I grew up in a political household, uh, was involved in some campaigns some successful, some not too successful, and ended up uh, working for a member of the legislature for a year or so, and then ended up uh, needing a little bit more to do, and a job opened up with a trade association. I took that, and over time found it that wasn't really as challenging as I'd like it to be, and not as lucrative as I'd like it to be, so kind of another group approached me, and one thing kind of led to the other. But I, I guess the thing I've learned is there's more I don't know than I do know, and uh, uh, it's, it's always something different. I mean, particularly in my line of work, I think it all, all three of us would probably have that. There's a new issue every day. I mean, I would happen to go out of town for the weekend and bingo, the phone rings and I got a client who's got a big time issue and you know, I don't know anything about it. You gotta get educated, try to figure it out, figure out what makes it tick. To answer your specific question, how they get into it, I think there are any number of ways. You can get at it from a background specific like John had, or a little bit like Jim and I have. Uh, I've always tried to get a young person that's in college to help me out during the session. Um, I think a lot of them find out it ain't what it is in the textbook. It's a little bit different, but uh, you know, it at least gives them some experience and they can learn, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to have to put up with this? Or do I want to try something else? But there are a lot of entry points. I think to, to comment on the last point you made, Chuck, that the local colleges and universities around Capital City really do a good job, I think, of trying to get students to, to come and, and have internships with legislators, with lobbyists, with trade associations, with media to try to determine that. And uh, there have been a couple, led, not correct anybody, there have been a couple legislators who have really been good at that. Harry Parrish, who these guys know Harry's gone now, but Harry was an old jobber and a great legislator from up, up in uh, Prince William County. He paid, I mean, this guy was a successful businessman, but he brought a, child, a young high school kid down here every year, changed him out every week, made him dress in a suit and tie, or, you know, it was a lady, made her dress appropriately and, and let him shadow him, put him up in a hotel room. Uh, there are others that have a, a child who comes in or a young person that follows them on a day-to-day -day basis. So that, that's a good experience for them. I, I started as an intern. It was part of my graduate school fellowship to be the, uh, mm -hmm. to be the legislative intern during session. And so that, that along with everything else just, mm -hmm. just, just sold it for you. That's right. Yeah. As you think back, particularly in the earlier years, we won't comment about all the delightful characters that you know now, <laughs> but when you think about past years of people you've worked with at the Capitol, whether they were governors or legislators or legislative staff, who are, who are some of the ones that come back to your mind as some of the most memorable 
characters that you You know, uh, there's so many, but <laughs> to answer that, I, two names come to the forefront with me, and that's the former speaker, A.L. Philpott. I had so much respect for him. We were both from Southside Virginia, and every time I appeared before a committee about a sheriff's issue, and he was always interested in sheriffs, he did all he could to challenge me. And that made me mature a little bit, and, he, and I think, you know, he kind of took me under his wing, <coughs> and I just enjoyed so much dealing with, with A.O. Philpott, and, and I've always thought about that. And, you know, he was so conservative back then. Today, he'd, I don't know what party he would be in, like, well, I, I guess I do, but, I mean, he, it, it, the flavor has <coughs> changed. It's all changed a little bit on the political spectrum as to what they really represent. But he was about as conservative as anyone there now, and he, he was a Democrat. And the other one that stands out, there was, there was always a, a fun challenge was Hunter Andrews. <laughs> and, you know, there are so many yeah. stories I could tell you about Hunter Andrews <laughs> and sheriffs and jails and the things that, you know, you go in to see Hunter and you, 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 you think, okay, I'm going to, here's my goal. And when you walked out, you, you were doing something for Hunter. That was a pretty tall order. And so uh, he knew how to use the system as well as anyone. Well, I... Um one of my mentors and the people taught me this, y'all will remember, uh, E.H. Williams, Judge Williams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Judge had been to VMI a lot longer, a lot earlier than me, and just kind of taught me the ropes. And I remember I was with the trash folks, and he taught me that a truck bill, as long as it said longer, wider, heavier, and faster, it was a good bill. <laughs> uh, and, but, but Judge was one, and then um, uh, Warren Stambaugh in Arlington who was just uh, uh, an interesting character and a uh, real student of the process and the institution. Well, you mentioned there, there are certainly some interesting people down there currently, but since we're talking about those that are deceased, that's kind of the, the yes. way. I would second what John said in terms of people. A.L. was a speaker when I first, uh, well, take that back John Warren Cook was but then AL came in and he, he was just a gentleman he was a bright super bright guy and I have I would think some of the early pieces of legislation that I carried they wouldn't pass without AL I mean no way in the world they would have passed I had one bill that candidly was voted down last day of the session I was in the TV room and guys hey, he lost a bill I said you know we gonna do spawn going about it time I got up to the chamber and they would let you walk in then if they were in recess. They'd recessed and he flagged me up to the dais and I, he said, uh, congratulations on your bill. I said, on what, losing it? And he said, no, it passed. <laughs> I said, the speaker, I was downstairs. He said, it ain't official till I say it's official. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he was right. I'd be remiss though if I didn't say one, a guy that I came to Richmond with and that's Al Smith. Mm. Um, yes. Al was, uh, again, I don't know what he'd be today, but he was a he was a self-made businessman, no college degree. Uh, came down here, got very active in politics. Tell you one quick story about him, and I would second Hunter Andrews too. But the uh, uh, when Rob was governor, uh, Al had been his finance chairman, and they were in a boardroom and trying to decide on who's going to be appointed some college boards. And they wanted to appoint uh, uh, a guy out of uh, down south side, Billy Camp. Now, Billy had gone to UVA, but Billy didn't graduate from UVA. Billy got a certificate of attendance from UVA <laughs> from the, signed by the president. <laughs> so his name was on the table for appointment to the board. And uh, one individual said, you know, he never he went to UVA, he never graduated. And the next one said, no, nah, he didn't graduate. Didn't even, you know, he never finished college. Got to Smith, Smith said, some of us never went to college. <laughs> and uh, Rob said, put him on the board. And he was put on the board. And Hunter was the same way. Hunter was just a, a very knowledgeable guy, high strung, uh, but you had to perform. If you didn't, uh, yeah. if, if you didn't do it right, he, he pointed me one day, I don't know, we had a bill, Jim was on recycling, and it moved, bounced around 10 different committees was in his committee and uh, I cornered him on, he was getting on the elevator, he turned around and pointed his finger right in my face. You lied to me, I never want to see you again. I thought, good God, that's the end of my career. 
So we were at a function uh, about two days later, and uh, Joe Gartland, who was real tight with with uh, Hunter, was there. He said, how's it going? I said, well, it was going pretty good about two days ago. I said, I think I'm going to truck driving school after this one. <laughs> he said, uh, not that I wouldn't like to enjoy driving a truck, but he said, uh, and I told him, oh, you know, Hunter, I said, Joe, you're on the inside. I'm on the outside. <laughs> That's a little different. So about 15 minutes later, I was up at the bar, Hunter came up by me and I said, uh, buy you a drink? And he said, uh, I'm surprised you're even talking to me. And that was him. He had, he had, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have cornered him where I did. And he made a mistake and life went on. Bill didn't pass, but then his life <laughs> went right. on. I've got a comment on the, on the A.L. Philpott part too. Very recently, I had the good folks here at the station take some video training tapes that I did in the late 1980s and put them on an MP4, I believe it's called now, so I could watch them. And there it was, I, I knew he had said it. Now, when I was interviewing the speaker in his office, he said, you know, sometimes the Republicans have a good idea on the bill. <laughs> and he said, so we kill it and then one of us brings it back the next year and it passes. <laughs> and and it, was, it was just between a puff of his pipe, that, that, that was it. And I had told that story to some of the younger Democratic delegates who complained that they seem to think that happens to some bills now, uh, that, that a bill, a good idea, that comes back another year with a different patron. And I said, things don't change. I said, Speaker Philpott just said it just as plain as day, and, and no embarrassment about that. That's just the way it was. Occasionally they had a good idea, and the bill would be brought up. Well, our time's going to be out and, and very quickly, and before it ends, uh, you all have other stories and other thoughts about the process, about elections past, about things. So. Let me just leave it wide open and see what else you would want to bring in. I know you're working on an issue now that's a hot issue, not talking about wine, that's always <laughs> hot, but uh, redistricting. And the sheriffs are always concerned that, and are being moving on to other areas of law enforcement because of salary. And Chuck, you always have a multiple number of big issues you're working on. Well, with our, with our organization, the sheriffs provide law enforcement, primary law enforcement, in 86 of the counties. We have today around 29,000 inmates in jail. <clears throat> we don't pay these deputies nearly enough to, to work in those jails and to get out and risk their lives. We lose them in the line of duty and they get assaulted. So that's always our top priority. And we have a couple of other issues that I would be remiss if I didn't point it. That is the mental health issue. Mm. We have people right. in jail that should not be in jail because they're mentally ill. And if, if we had adequate of facilities otherwise, you know, they, they may not be there. They're there on nuisance charges, trespassing, petty larceny, and the sheriffs are doing the best they can handling these mentally ill people, but we've got thousands of them. And it's, 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 uh, it's very disappointing to see that go on. We're making inroad to these commissions. Has, has, has done a lot. We've got a long way to go, it, and this stuff takes money. Well, the, my, my two current clients, the, the wine industry is interesting because it is evolving into a mature industry, and the <coughs> issues be, become more complex. Chuck, Chuck was on the opposite side of some of it and would help, helped us work to a very unique compromise on distribution, but it's it's an evolving industry that's maturing. Uh, the redistricting is its own set of challenges. And if you've been around long enough, you've been on all sides of redistricting and, and, and where the lines are drawn and how they're drawn. But it's something that impacts all the way from the General Assembly up to Congress. And there's, um, but both parties have been uh, but both parties have drawn districts to benefit themselves. And uh, seeing that, having a different perspective on that has been, has been, an, has been an interesting exercise. 
Chuck, I think I'm getting a signal that our time no is problem. up. And sorry we didn't get to some of your issues, but thank you all three for your conversation you've had. Very informative. Look thank forward. you for being. Thank you. Thank, for, thank, you, thank you for having us. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by the Virginia Education Association. An investment in teachers today will pay dividends tomorrow. Dignity Memorial. The Dignity Network provides professional and compassionate funeral, memorial, cremation, and cemetery services throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Healthcare and Hospital Association for jobs, the economy, and public health. Virginia Tourism Corporation, promoting why Virginia is for lovers, lovers of wine and craft beers, the outdoors, beaches, history, music, and more. Fall in love with Virginia at virginia.org. Additional support provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.